Now, good morning. It's um, nice to be with you today. I appreciate the invitation to come by George. I know he's off for a few days, although uh, he's a sort of a boy who doesn't switch off too much. Um, and I appreciate your prayers for us in these days. First of all, as a family, thank you for, I know that you've been remembering us in your prayers, Beverly's mum at this time, just so soon after her dad, and so she's with us. There's five women in our house. It's not easy. <laughs> but uh, it's good to know that the Lord's people are praying for us. And also then, Everett and myself, as we, we preach these nights up in Money More, we start our second week tonight, and uh, the Lord has come in and blessed in the week that's passed. Your own pastor come up on Thursday night with us, and he preached the gospel. And after the meeting, a lady asked, could you see us? And we, uh, it's a joy to bring just to be there when someone is born of the Spirit of God. And uh, she was under great conviction of sin. And uh, she just came uh, as she was. And that's the way you have to come. And uh, then we, we heard on Friday night that she had phoned her family, her sisters, and, and told them that she'd got saved. The Bible says, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth and believe in thine heart, well then, you're really saved. And it's good. Mind you, to be part of God's work when God's moving. It's not of ourselves now. Jonah says, salvation's of the Lord. And so we're totally dependent on him. So we pray that the Lord will bless in the days that are to come. Let's just come before the Lord as we look at his word. <clears throat> Our God and Father, this morning we do thank you that Jesus loves the little children. Jesus loves me, this I know. Remember one of old said wonderful things in the Bible I say, but this is the greatest, that Jesus loves me. Thank you for our Saviour's love, Calvary love, agape love, a love that knows no living, and a love that is full of compassion, deep pity for us. We thank you for that. Pray this morning as we turn to your word, O God, that as pages would shine before us. Pray that as we, we study it and glean from it today, that they will give us a portion from it and that they will speak to us, O God. Help us as we speak this morning. We look for help and ask for a blessing. Pray that the name of God and the name of the Lord Jesus Christ will be glorified in the things we say today. We ask it in our Saviour's name. Amen. I want you to turn, please, in your Bibles this morning to the first book of Kings in chapter 17. The first book of Kings in chapter 17. Now, I know, I think it was last year in your Bible class that you studied Elijah. Many a conversation I had with George about it. And so, in the past few weeks, I've actually been in Belfast and Ballysillen the last four Thursday nights, uh, or in January, and I have been just speaking again about Elijah, and I've really, it's really been encouraging to look at him again. He's one of the great characters in our Old Testament, a man that was used mightily of God. And so, I just want to speak on a story from his life in 1 Kings chapter 17 this morning, just for a few moments. 1 Kings chapter 17. Verse 8. 1 Kings 17, verse 8. And the word of the Lord came unto him, Elijah, saying, Arise, get thee to Seraphah, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. And so he arose and went to Seraphah. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there, gathering of sticks, and he called to her. And said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel, that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise, and behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it for me and for my son that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not. Now this woman was full of fear. And so Elijah says, Fear not. 
Go and do as I have said, but make me therefore a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail, unto the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And she went, she went and did according to the saying of Elijah. And she and he and her house did eat many days. And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the work, the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. Lovely story. And the God will bless his word to us this morning. And we'll come to chapter 17 of the book of Kings. There's a man who comes on to the pages of Scripture. His name is Elijah. He was God's man for God's time. There's no doubt about that. He was from a place called Tishbe. The first verse of chapter 17 tells us of Elijah the Tishbe. We don't know very much about Tishbite. We know that it was a mountainous rocky area in the land of Gilead. And as we look at the life of Elijah, we realize that he was a, a mountain man, really. A mountain man. And we're in Kilkeel this morning, but anyway, we'll say no more. You know what I mean. He was a mountain man. You can see his appearance. If you look in 2 Kings 1 and verse 8, you can see his dress. He was skirted around his loins, it's just said. It actually, in fact, it says something very strange about him in verse 8 of chapter 1 of the second book. It says that he was a hurry man. A hurry man. I don't know what you think of that, you know. Do you remember Esau? In the, uh, remember Jacob and Esau? Do you remember Esau was a hurry man? Remember then how, how Jacob went in and to see, or, or uh, yes, Jacob went in and, was de- and deceived his father Isaac. Remember they killed the lamb and they put the skins. His father was blind. But Esau had, had not your hair in his body. John the Baptist as well was described as that. There's men like that, you know. It took me six months trying to grow a moustache and a beard, no matter how hard I tried. But Elijah was, so we, we, see, we see his appearance. And, and then we can see his actions. If you look in, in the first book here in chapter 19 and verse 8, he was a mighty man. It said that he, that he ate, he went and he ate a dinner, and he went for 40 days on the strength of it. It definitely wouldn't do me, I have to say. But it done a age anyway. And such was the strength of the man. You can read time after time, actually, if you read carefully, that he, he, there were times that he actually ran 25 miles. You can read if you read the text carefully. So we have his appearance and, and we have his actions. And there's his accommodation in, in the seventh chapter, the second book, the seventh chapter in verse 3, tells us that he actually dwelt in caves at times. And so he was an outdoor type of a man, an outdoor type of a guy, Elijah. And so he appears on the scene of time. That the land of Israel at this time was full of Baal worship. And the people once again had turned away from God. And the worship of Baal was prevalent in the land of Israel. There was a king that was reigning at the time, and his name was Ahab. And he was a wicked, wicked atheist. He didn't believe in God in any shape or form. He had a wife by the name of Jezebel. And if Ahab was bad, his wife was ten times worse. And they completely had turned away from God, turned the people away from God. In fact, in the previous chapter, in chapter 16 and verse 30, it tells us that Ahab did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. The wickedest king, perhaps, that ever lived in the land of Israel. And so God has his men for his time, his people for their time. And onto this scene of time, onto this idolatrous scene, Baal, by the way, also was a, a god who was, was related to the god of the storm, the god of the wind and the rain, and also a, a, a sexual god as well. And so the, the land of Israel was completely immoral. It was completely turned away from God. Any 
any, um, anything decent that they had had gone. And God had raised a man, Elijah, the Tishbite, and Elijah comes on to the scene of time. He brings him, first of all, in chapter 17 to, to Cherith. He brings him to a brook. Then we can read from verse 8 on that he brings him to a barrel. And then we can read from verse 17 on that he brings him to a boy. A brook, a barrel, and a boy. This was God's training ground for Elijah in chapter 17. He was going to experience God at the brook. He brought him to the brook Cherith. And he spent a while there. There had been a, a drought in the land. It hadn't rained in the land for three years. And so the ground was barren. It was dusty and dry. There was no water in the land of Israel. And yet God brings Elijah to a brook, to Cherith, to the brook. And there the brook flows. And God teaches Elijah many great lessons at Cherith. He teaches him total dependence on himself. He was in the middle of nowhere. There's two things that the body needs to sustain itself and to maintain itself. The first thing is water. The second one is food. And so God supplies water to him in a barren land at the brook Cherith. And as he sits at Cherith and, and meditates upon God, and God teaches him mighty lessons, his stomach is empty and he begins to get hung hungry, and God begins to send food to him. It's amazing that God sends ravens now, ravens, flesh-eating birds. In those lands, when you see something laying dead, the ravens are around it everywhere. And God sends these ravens from heaven with flesh in their beak. And they come and they, they, they sweep down to where Elijah is and, and their beak opens and the flesh falls. And that happened every morning and every evening. And God provides for his servant. I Means it's always like that, isn't it? God supplies for us. God shall supply all your need according to his riches in Christ Jesus. You'll notice that the verse doesn't say God will supply all our greed. We always want more. Something inside the human the human makeup that we always want more. We want a, something bigger, something better, something greater. But God supplies our need. He supplies our need. And so God was supplying Elijah's need at the brook. So there was a brook. And then God told him, he had taught him great lessons at Cherith. And uh, he says uh, in verse 9, he says, Arise, leave Cherith, Elijah, go to Seraphat. A hundred miles. He leaves Cherith and he goes to Seraphat. 100 miles on foot. That's a right down there, isn't it? That's Belfast to Dublin. And so Elijah leaves and uh, he leaves Cherith. God has told him great lessons. And he heads for little, this little town, Seraphat, which was right the epicenter of Baal worship. It was five miles from Sidon. He was going right into the jaws of the devil, by the way. He was going right to Ahab's territory, right to Ahab and Jezebel's back door when he went to Seraph. And so he leaves Cherith. He travels the 100 miles. God says to him in verse 9, he says, I have commanded a widow woman to sustain thee. I've commanded her now to sustain, sustain thee. A widow woman. And so God brings them from, from Cherith he brings him to, to Seraphoth, and uh, God was going to teach him just a, a great lesson. That was a lesson of patience. He was going to have to wait on God. I can't see too many in here this morning being blessed with patience. I know I don't anyway. Someone said of how the old saint got down on his knees one morning and he prayed to God, God, give me patience quickly, please. And, and it's something that we all are very short of sometimes. You're sitting at the red light, aren't you? And there's an old fella in front of you. And when it turns green, he doesn't go right away. And uh, the old fire rises in you, doesn't it? 
And sometimes you reach for the horn and then you think to yourself, that's not very Christian, maybe. Very few of us have patience, but God was going to teach him to wait. To wait on God. There's something to wait on God. To wait for the will of God. Sometimes people have to wait for years on the will of God. Moses waited 40 years on in the desert. We often say how Moses' life was, was a span was 120 years. 40, 40, 40. The first 40, he thought he was somebody. Charles Swindle said. The second 40, he knew he was a nobody. And the last 40, God taught him that he could make a somebody out of a nobody. He spent his 40, first 40 years in the palace of Egypt, being educated, walking about with his head in the air, maybe. And then God took him from there and he took him into the wilderness. And for 40 years he walked around the backside of the wilderness, the Bible tells him. And then that great day when he come to that bush that was burning, but it wasn't being consumed, and God spoke to him from it. And the last 40 years of his life, from the years of 80 until the age of 120 years of age, he led those great tribe, the children of Israel, through the wilderness and through the desert. But he had to wait on God. Aaron didn't wait on God. Moses went up to the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments, and when he came down, you remember how the children of Israel were dancing around the golden calf, and Aaron hadn't waited. And Samuel said to Saul, before he went into the battle, he says, go, and he says, wait up the sacrifice for me now. And I'll come and I'll sacrifice before the Lord. And Saul didn't wait. And disobeyed God. And he'd just wait for one week on Samuel. And he wouldn't wait. And Peter, on resurrection ground too, you remember how those disciples waited Peter got into the fishing boat and went fishing. He says, I go a fishing. He didn't wait. And sometimes we have to wait for the will of God and wait for the word of God. And perhaps young person or older friend in the meeting this morning, perhaps you're, you're waiting on something coming from God. And perhaps there's, a, there's an impatience beginning to, to bubble inside you. God's timing is always perfect. An old brethren preacher told me this one time. I thought it was great advice. He said, God doesn't give the ticket until the train's ready to leave. And God brings it almost to the wire every time. And then he proves his providence and he proves his presence is always there. Wait on the word of God. Wait on the will of God. And so Elijah waited on God and he left Cherith. And he goes to serve at the waiting on God. And then verse 10, you'll notice that he walked with God. He arose and he went to serve it. Now, just the very thing that God had told him. He says, go. And he says, when you enter the city, he says, I have told the widow woman to sustain thee. I have commanded her, actually, to sustain thee. And so <coughs> Elijah has walked a hundred miles. And he comes in through the gates of this little city, the gate of Seraphith. And he goes in, what's the first person he sees? To prove that he's in the will of God. To prove that he's waited on God. To prove that he's walking with God. God has told him, I've commanded a widow woman to sustain thee. And this minute, the second he walks in through the gates of the city, first ten, behold, the widow woman was her gathering sticks. God is his people for every time. And God put it in this widow woman's heart, who was in the house with her only son, to go out on this occasion and to gather a few sticks. And so she leaves the house, she gathers the sticks, she starts to gather the sticks around the streets, the pieces of timber, the pieces of sticks that were left, just to enable her to light a fire. And as she's picking up these sticks, imagine this guy, this fellow walks through the gates of the city, girded round himself with this leather apron or something like that, a big hairy man, perhaps a head of her, beard on him, hairy arms, everything else. He had walked 100 miles before that. He'd been at Cherith, the brook, and so he would have been a sight to behold, I'm sure. And she looks at him, and he looks at her, and he realizes that this is the woman that God has told me about. 
And so he asks her, <clears throat> first end of verse 10, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel, that I may drink. So this individual, he asks this lady for a drink. His, his, his heart is, 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 is down, he's tired, he's weary from his journey. This has been a physical journey. It's been a hundred miles. It's been physical. It's been a moral journey. He has been heading towards the lady, the widow of Cherif. It has been a, 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 a spiritual journey as well. He's just landed in this city. He realizes within himself he's only five miles from Sidon. He's five miles from the epicenter of Baal worship. And he asks this lady for a drink. Walking with God. Verse 11. Working by gone. And as she went to fax it, he called unto her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in your hand as well. Now, it's not a big deal, really, sure, it's not. If somebody rapped our door this morning, whom I know, and said, Could you have a cup of tea? And by the way, this is something that happens in the country. I don't know how it happens around Kilkeel. Some days I'm out and about. <coughs> And uh, we all do it, those of us that travel about a bit. And uh, you're going, what time is it? It's half ten. You could be doing a cup of coffee, you know, or a cup of tea. And there's no filling stations anywhere in the middle of the country. And then you think to yourself, such and such lives up that way road. And maybe call them in and see. And then when you call, you know the houses. There's houses like this. There's houses that you know you can go and wrap the door and say, ah, good to see you. Come on in, the kettle's on. And you can go in for a moment or two and get a cup of tea and so on and go on. It's good to have a home like that, by the way, saint of God this morning. I trust you have a home like that where people feel welcome. And, and, and anybody's welcome. It's good to have the people of God in your home. There's no people like God's people. I have said this to Beverly the past few weeks with her mum not been well. And people call to see her. Neighbours and pastors. And people in the Lord's work. And you know, they have a great gift. I was saying this to William John just in the back room this morning. They have a great gift. Your own pastor too. He can just come in. And, and he can just sit for a moment or two and listen. And don't talk over the top of people. It's a real gift, this. And, and you can listen. And, and, and if people, that's not well, if they want to talk, they can. And if they can't, then you can talk. And, and, and then you read the scriptures and you pray and uh, you slip out again. And you're in and out in 15, 10 or 15 minutes. That's a great gift that a pastor has. And your pastor has it and many have it of the Lord's people. Just able to bring a word of comfort. And just their very presence being felt in the home is something else. There's no people like the Lord's people. But Elijah asks this widow woman, he must be full of hospitality. He says to her, bring me a drink, please, drink of water. And he says, bring me a morsel of bread. He asked her for a drink and a sandwich, really. And the woman, of course, she had a great need in her home. She, uh, she says to him, she says, uh, verse 12, <clears throat> as the Lord thy God liveth. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? She lived in the center of Baal worship. But the moment Elijah walked into the city, she knew that he was a man of God. The God of Israel now, not the God, not Baal. Idolatrous God, the God of Israel. He knew, she knew that he was a godly man. She says, as they God liveth. <clears throat> I have not a cake. I have no bread in the house. Absolutely nothing. The cupboard was bare. But she says of a handful of meal. And a little oil and a cruise and a wee jug. A little oil, olive oil or something like that. And I'm gathering two sticks. Two sticks. The fire wasn't going to have a hard light. It wasn't going to have a, a big gel back on this last cake. All it was going to take was a wee flame. All she needed was two sticks. I'm gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it for my son and that they're going to eat it and die. So there was a woman. She had an only son. 
If you read the next story in the chapter, verse 17, the barrel of the boy, you can notice that there was a dreadful loss happened in her home. She was a distressed lady, but she had a dynamic Lord. But she had just one son. And uh, he was in the house. And uh, she had just resigned herself to the fact that it was all over and that I'll just go and bake this one cake and I'll split it in half and I'll eat a bit of it and my son will eat a bit of it and that's life over. That's how far down she was. So her heart was full of anxiety and her life was full of fear. She was going to go in and she was going to close the door for the last time. It was a hopeless and a helpless case. And the word of the Lord comes to her, Elijah. It's amazing, isn't it? Elijah says in verse 13, he says this. Here's the first thing he says to her, fear not. Don't be afraid. Fear not. He says, go and do as I have said. Isn't it sometimes in life when we have great fear, Sometimes in life's, life's journey when things come in and our hearts are full of fear and anguish and worry and panic, that just God is sometimes a way of saying, fear not, fear not. And whatever your circumstance is this morning, in life God says, fear not, fear not. You know, if someone would have told me at the start of September all that had went on in our lives in the last five months, I wouldn't have believed it. But my father-in-law would have died one Sunday night. And now my mother-in-law has been diagnosed with cancer. And he wouldn't have wrote it all down. He couldn't have. But God seems to sometimes come in and just say to you, fear not. I'm here. Gives us comfort through his word, through his scriptures. And then the, the ways of God and the things of God. And God was working. God had renewed Elijah's pride. He was going to have to depend on a widow woman. Unfortunately, the widow women in Israel were almost the lowest of the low. It's terrible, isn't it? That's the way they were thought of. And yet God put his servant, he, his total dependence on the widow woman that had nothing. This man who was on a journey from Cherith to Mount Carmel, which would be his finest hour, when 450 prophets of Baal would, have, would be slain, when the fire would come from heaven and burn the sacrifice in that occasion. And when God's name would be glorified in the whole of Israel, this was the man that was going to be involved in it. And God brought him 100 miles and just got him to put his full dependence on a widow woman with one son, with a handful of meal and a measure of oil. That was it. God uses the simple things sometimes, doesn't he? Don't we make God's work and God's way sometimes complicated? And sometimes it's just, it's just the little that we have. It's just the little bit that we have when we give it to him that God bless him. The wee boy in the Gospels, he had just five loaves and two fish. But he gave it all. The wee boy didn't open the top of the lunchbox and keep one fish and one loaf for himself, one bat for himself. He gave it all to the Lord. And when he gave it all, 5,000 people and more were blessed. God had renewed Elijah's pride. God had refined this person. He is in a place of famine, a place of idolatry. He was in a melting pot, a real furnace here. He was, God was walking by, he was walking by God, and then he was witnessing for God. Here was the great witness. What a picture. The lady goes in and she begins and she makes the bread. Our time's gone. She makes the bread and she brings it out to Elijah. And then he comes into her home and he enjoys the hospitality in this home for three years he stayed. There was three years between here and the Mount Carmel. And for three years Elijah stays in this lady's home. And every time that lady went to the barrel, there was a handful of meal. And every time she lifted the wee cruise, the wee jug, there was oil there. You'll notice something. 
God didn't fill the barrel to the brim. He didn't fill the jug till it was running over. He could have. But every time that widow went, and she reached her hand into the bar, there was a handful of meal come out. And every time she went to the jug, like this, there was a wee drop of oil on the bottom of it. And every day, Elijah and the widow and the son depended on God. Oh, he'll not, he'll not fill our barrels to the brim, you know. George Sindel says this. He says, Elijah got his eyes off the barrel and got it onto the benefactor. That's good. He got it off the barrel and he got it onto the benefactor, the one that was filling the barrel. You know what it comes down to again, time after time after time, it comes down to faith in God. Having faith in God. I was reading again the other day about George Muller, that German man who left Germany, called of God, he come to the city of Bristol, and he opened an orphanage on the streets of Bristol, and te- over 10,000 boys went through the orphanage in his lifetime. And there was a man who totally depended on God. And you know the story, some of you perhaps, how one night his wife said to him, there was over 200 boys in the orphanage. And his wife says to him at bedtime one night, George, there's no breakfast for the morning. And he says, what do you mean there's no breakfast? She says, there's nothing. There's no cereal. There's no bread and there's no milk. There'll be no cereal. There'll be no toast for the boys tomorrow morning. And she went to bed. George went to the kitchen and he opened the cupboard and she was right. There was absolutely nothing. And he closed the cupboards and he went up the stairs and he got down to the side of his bed as his wife lay in bed and he prayed to God that God would supply their need. And he got into bed and his wife says to him, George, what are we going to do? And he says, well, I've left it with God. I ain't going to sleep. And he pulled the covers over his head. At half past three that morning, in the middle of the night, the hours of the morning, there was a grocer, a man who owned a grocery shop three streets away, and he wakened at half past three, and he got out of bed. And his wife says to him, what are you doing, John? He says, God has told me that there's problems at the orphanage, and he says, I ain't going down to sort it out. And he went down, and he went into the back door of his shop in the hours, early hours of the morning, and he lifted boxes, and he filled them with cereal and with bread and with milk. And he put them on the front of his bike and he went up this street and down another and up to the door of George Muller's orphanage. He lifted the boxes off the front of the bike. He put them at the front door and he slipped home and back in the bed again. And George Muller got up at six o'clock in the morning and he went down and he opened the front door of his orphanage and God has supplied their need. A man of faith. And the hymn reader said, when we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed, or the day is half done, when we've reached the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's full giving is only begun. His love has no limit. His grace has no measure. His power has no boundary known unto men. For out of his infinite Riches in Jesus. He gave us. And he gave us. And he gave us again. Elijah. Waiting for God. Working for God. Walking with God. Witnessing for God. I wonder are we. I wonder are we able in these days. For God to use us. Because he hasn't changed. And times change. And circumstances change. But God doesn't change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he can use us. Just simple people. Just like Elijah, mountain men. Country men. Nobodies from nowhere. And he can take us. And he can mould us. And he can use us. And vessels for the master's service. I wonder am I. I wonder are you ready to do that.
trust that God will bless his word this morning. <clears throat> Let's sing a hymn, please. Hymn number 